Well, if you saw the March 10th edition of the Sunday News, the, the magazine section, you saw that picture and a nice article about our next guest who's been here a couple times before. As a matter of fact, Western New York's own Glenn Plaskin, and you probably know, concert pianist, a celebrated biographer, and that is magazine articles on the famous people like Catherine Hepburn and uh, Calvin Klein and more recently Lena Horne and Senator Edward Kennedy and is with us this morning. Thanks. Let's talk about uh, Senator Edward Kennedy and the circumstances of that interview. It had to be a fascinating person to interview. Well, it took about six months to arrange the interview and uh, he finally invited me for dinner and um, I must say at the beginning you hope that when you interview somebody that they're going to open up to you sure but he really was boring and so were his children they kept def I would say what's it like to be a candidate and they said we're not going to answer that question we're not going to answer that question and in fact the son finally said you're asking all the wrong questions so at the end of the dinner I couldn't wait to get rid of the children I said don't you have something to do <laughs> and I was left alone in the room with his, with their father and he said something that I brought along that I found rather touching. He was sitting there smoking a cigar and getting sort of sad, and there were pictures all around the room of his brothers. And he said this, my brothers were my dearest friends. They were just human beings and wanted to be considered that way, but they were extraordinary. I cared very deeply about them, loved them. I missed them. No day goes by when I don't. That gap in my life will be with me for the rest of my life. No way to bridge that. And he started to cry. The cheers of the last presidential election have barely faded, and speculation about the race in 1988 has already begun. Speculation that certainly includes the senior senator from Massachusetts, Edward Kennedy. Whatever his ultimate decision, the senator insists that his family and his children are his top priority. I always uh, thought that uh, perhaps the greatest gift that I could give uh, to them was not only a, a faith in God and a a religious uh, belief and love of country, but uh, beyond that, uh, a sense of, uh, of family. It was recently reported that your son Teddy might make a run for Congress when he's old enough to do that, which will be in about a year. If he should decide to run, what advice as a father and as a politician would you give him? You need to uh, have the, the kind of uh, uh, caring and concern for people and people's problems. And uh, then I think um, a, uh, a willingness to, to, to stand up and be counted on. It's been important because of the tragedies the Kennedy family has endured, the challenges they have faced. Among them, Ted Jr.'s battle with cancer that required the amputation of his right leg. I know that your son Patrick has been very involved in the hunger issue. And unfortunately, he was not able to go on the trip to Africa. What happened? Uh, unfortunately, he uh, Patrick's an asthmatic, uh, and he's a chronic asthmatic, and he had uh, quite a, uh, a serious spell just prior to the time that uh, we left and was unable to go because of the problems that uh, exist there atmospherically. But during, I know there are nights when you had to administer injections to Patrick. You've certainly been worried about him. As you sat there watching him, how did it feel to you to see one of your children suffer? Like well, I, I think it's uh, natural uh, all over the world. I think per perhaps uh, too often we uh, just think that, uh, you know, we're the only ones who uh, shed tears or feel this mm -hmm. anguish and anxiety when you see a child suffer, but uh, that is replicated in uh, uh, the, uh, the darkest uh, uh, jungles of uh, Southeast uh, Asia or, or Africa or uh, really uh, any place of this uh, world. Uh, it was a couple weeks ago today that uh, we introduced you to uh, somebody who's been a guest on our program uh, in a kind of a different light. Glenn Plaskin, who's uh, known far and wide as a celebrity interviewer, was able to uh, take us inside uh, the family and the personal life of uh, Senator Ted Kennedy, who's not exactly known for doing lots of warm, deep, revealing interviews, especially in the last couple of years. But Glenn was able to talk to him about his, his role as father, his role as, as the male head of a family that has really been through hell and back. And uh, it was a very warm and a very revealing interview. And we're glad to have Glenn in the flash. It's good to have you nice with us. Thanks you. for coming. Thank you. The, uh, th let me start with that, because that's, that's still very fresh in my mind. Uh, why don't we see more of Ted Kennedy, the person? Because that's an awfully charismatic, awfully likable man there talking about his children and talking about leaving the Senate floor early so that he could spend some time with his children. Why don't we see more of that? About four years ago, he was interviewed on television and he was burned. Somebody cornered him. I don't, I don't even remember who it was. I think it was Roger Mudd, but I'm not sure. And ever since then, oh, yeah. he said he would never do another TV interview. So I interviewed him for a magazine. 
And then uh, I asked his press secretary if he would consider doing a TV interview. And it took about six months to arrange. And finally he said yes, but you had to submit questions in advance. And uh, he only did it because there was a good personal rapport between us. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was absolutely, as you could see in the interview, absolutely charming and very revealing. And uh, I'm told that it's the best he's ever come across on TV. Yeah. The interesting thing is now is that we have a man joining us right now who has done the only authorized interview with Joan Kennedy in two and a half years. You know what I always wondered about her? She was kind of so silent and she stood by her man during Chappaquiddick. Does she really buy the story that Teddy <clears throat> told? I didn't ask her that. I didn't. Was it a watershed in her life in terms of being a down part? I mean, was, was it one of the real links in the chain that broke the marriage? I don't know. Apparently in the book, uh, the author talks about the fact that the marriage was not a good marriage and that Chappaquiddick was the beginning of the end of the marriage. I think that's the way she put it. And that sounds possible. And through all that, she said that what's kept her together is religion and slowly, and therapy. And her women friends, I said, do you like going out to lunch with men or women? She said, only women, and only one woman at a time. She doesn't like these ladies' luncheons. She likes just one. I thought that was interesting. She said a lot of women could get a lot of help from other women. No wonder that book was so injuring then, because it was a close friend. Really, that's just about mm -hmm. the bottom of the barrel. We must turn this book around. <laughs> okay, that book is gone, but we will mention the family circle issue, which you'll find a chocolate chip cookie on the cover. But inside is where you will find the article of uh, Glenn Plaskin's exclusive interview with Joan Kennedy, the first in two and a half years. To Glenn is one of these people that you just hate because he's the one that gets the interviews that everybody else is trying to get, but doesn't quite. <laughs> uh, for example, uh, Catherine Hepburn. Oh, I who use does not devious means. Yeah, devious means. Do you dress up in waiters' uniforms? And, and no, and no. I called her agent, and he said, forget it. It's hopeless. You'll never get her for an interview. So I said, oh, well, that probably means I probably will. <laughs> so what I did is I had written a book, as you know, about Horowitz. And right. I sent her the book. And one morning I was sitting at work, and the phone rang. And I heard this voice saying, this is Mr. Plaskin. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh my god. I said, this isn't her, is it? And she said, uh-huh. <laughs> she said, would you like to come for tea? So I thought I would die. So I called a florist and I said, send over some, just something tasteful. Sure. I got a bouquet that you could take to Buckingham Palace. I took from it about five flowers and I went over for tea and all stars like to make entrances. And she walked in the room and I was waiting and she looked at me and she said, oh my God, I thought you'd be 50 because the book's 600 pages. <laughs> and she brought the maid and she said, no, this is Mr. Plaskin. He's 10 years old. Give him a cookie. <laughs> and every word out of her mouth was a joke. It was fabulous. The article in the, in the Sunday paper said that you find women easier to interview than men. Um, Especially if they're smart. For instance, Katherine Hepburn, she's just smart as you can imagine. And um, as opposed to, I won't say that, but I told her that I'd gone to the White House to interview Mrs. Reagan. And I had enough questions for three hours. After 15 minutes, we were done. The woman had nothing to say. And I'm telling <laughs> Katherine Hepburn that, and she's sitting there, you know how she sounds, and she said, she was a dumb bitch when she's 19, and she was a dumb bitch now. Oh, no. And I said, but she's enslaved to the president. She loves him so. And she said, enslavement's the only thing she's fit for. <laughs> Nancy Reagan, you had the chance to interview her. Uh, I did. <laughs> what was that like? The there we see you in the White House sitting with Nancy oh, Reagan. Oh, God, wasn't I scared? My, my hair had <laughs> static cling that morning. Um, well, to tell you the truth, she's not as interesting as Katherine Hepburn, but uh, the conversation got personal because we talked about the, uh, the attempted assassination of her husband, and she uh, had met the Pope a few months after the president recovered and she started to cry toward the end of the interview because she confided that uh, she had discussed with the pope everyone's mortality i mean we're all going to go but they're in very special positions and can you imagine sitting with the president of the united states and the pope talking about your fears about your husband dying and she got very emotional and started to cry you said you don't think people realize how hard it is to do an interview with a Senator Edward Kennedy or with a Catherine. It is hard. You know, the morning of the interview, you sit home and you wonder why you were ever born. I mean, you just don't want to do it. I did Lena Horne last Tuesday, mm. and I had seen her show on Broadway, and she was so wonderful. And I got to the hotel, and she came into the room. She said, 
hi, I'm Lena. I mean, she was just so nice. And she told me so many things. Um, I'm not sure if I can repeat it. <laughs> well, it hasn't stopped you so far today. I mean, you know. <laughs> Go ahead. What the heck? We're all friends. Well, you know, within a half hour, she was telling me that she... Her, she had been like a piece of ice her whole life, and she never had an orgasm until she was 40. She, and, <laughs> it was really quite interesting. Uh, uh, you also did an interview with uh, Joan Rivers, who many people consider to be uh, very shrill, uh, very, uh, not abrasive, but you know, a little on the loud side. She was very nice. You know, the day I went to see her was about six months after her mother had died. Mm -hmm. And she told me that people always expect her to be funny. And she was on the plane flying from New York to, uh, from California to New York for the funeral. And people were coming up asking her for an <laughs> autograph. And she said she was signing on wet paper. Oh, you know, she terrible. was just crying and yeah. signing. And I, I found her, comedians in general, I also did Carol Burnett, they tend to be very serious when you see them in person, very sensitive. And it's funny that Joan Rivers is always insulting everybody, but when you see her in person, she's very sensitive to criticism herself. Your interview with Calvin Klein really was kind of a landmark in your career, because after doing Calvin Klein, everything started to fall I owe everything to him. I owe everything to him, including my job at M Magazine. I remember the day he was sitting in his office reading what I had written about him for Playboy, and he liked it very much. He picked up the phone and he said, I'm sending somebody down, hire him. He knew I needed a job. And he said, I don't like what you're wearing. Take your clothes off. I said, excuse me? He said, take your clothes off. He said, you're going to wear my clothes, and I'm going to wear yours. And I literally put on his clothes, and he's two inches taller than I am. And I said, but it's too big. He said, just put your hands in your pocket. Nobody will. You know, the <laughs> that was a Thursday. I went down, was interviewed for the magazine, and I started on Monday. So I'm very grateful to him. Being an interviewer can be uh, a difficult position, too, because I would think that you want to come away with a great story. But when you get in there and they take you in, for instance, you had dinner with the Kennedys, that you must be torn if you get a great scoop or you get something very personal, that if you put it down on paper, they're going to say, why, well, that was private and, and now I don't trust you anymore. I think that it can be very incestuous to become friends with somebody and then try to interview them. And the funny thing is, is that I used to think, oh, Kennedy likes me, or this one likes me. It's not that they don't like me, but if you want to do a good job, I don't think you should become friends with them. And number two is, I often ask myself, why do I leave these interviews depressed, which I often do? And I think it's because, to get, for instance, to have dinner with the Kennedys, you're very in. But at the same time, you're not in, you're out. 